Hello and welcome to Louis Philippe in pursuit of excellence. My guest today is one of the most amazingly talented actors of our generation. He truly is a star of screen and stage, and most important of all, a tennis player. Nazirin <laughs> Shah, Nazir, great to see you. Hi, Thanks and, so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have you on the show. But the first question I have to ask you is about tennis. Right. So you play tennis regularly. I have two wives. <laughs> uh, uh, I was honeymooning with one when I discovered the second one. <laughs> I don't think she's ever forgiven me for it. Ratna, my wife. I tried yes. to get, we were at the Fort Aguada where they had this wonderful clay court. So I just wandered on and picked up a racket and started hitting and I found I was hitting all right. I've always been fond of cricket. In fact, I played quite a bit as a child. So that's where tennis and I discovered our lifelong love for each other. And you play, you still play now? I still play, yes, but I've been off it for a few weeks because of slight back trouble, but uh, I will play as long as I can walk. Well, join the club on back trouble. We all have the same, <laughs> same issues. But uh, it's, it's, it's so, it's so, so uh, wonderful to hear that you play tennis because honestly, I came from that background and then I looked at uh, cinema in a different light. Went to cinemas as we grow up and uh, uh, travel around the world and my biggest form of entertainment is cinema. That's what uh, we entertain mm -hmm. ourselves with. And more in India than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So, draw a comparison between uh, a sport and cinema. I, I'd say between sport and acting, the, the state of readiness of an actor has to be that of a sportsman. Uh, Thanks for informing me, by the way, that you're from the world of tennis. I would never have known otherwise. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, as Hamlet said, the readiness is all. Uh, an actor on stage or in front of the camera, more on stage, I would say, has his strategy worked out. He knows his moves. He knows what he's going to attempt. He knows where to attack, where to defend, etc. But the unexpected might happen. Uh, and that is where... Uh, uh, the similarities are. The difference, however, is that acting is a sport where both can win. It's not a uh, annihilate the opponent kind of sport. It's, it's, it's a game which is played together. It is played with harmony in, and it is played with a desire to bring the best out of the other, which is true of sport as well. But in sport, the ultimate aim is to win. Uh, in, in acting, the ultimate aim is to is to get across together. Actors suffer from an ailment called onomatomania, which is the urge to keep repeating a word or a phrase just for the sake of repeating it. <laughs> <laughs> I've had onomatomania since I was a child because I just imitate you know voices I'd heard. V. M. Chakrapani on the yes, radio, yes, you know, yes, or Vizzy on the radio. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, there was no TV, of course, those days, or or, or, or John Wayne's voice, or Clark Gable's voice, yeah. or uh, most important influence was a man called Jeffrey Kendall, who ran a troupe called Shakespeare Anna, who, who used to visit our school every year. He he was my guiding light, and he's the man I. So, who would have been your inspiration at that time? He was the man. He was the man. I didn't know it till later, though, but I really worshipped his, the ground he walked on. He, he ran this company uh, called Shakespeare Anna, which performed Shakespeare, sometimes Shaw, sometimes Wilde and Goldsmith and so on, to educational institutions only. They never did a commercial performance. I have never heard Shakespeare spoken better till today. And I include all the stuff I've seen in England and, and the English don't know how to do Shakespeare. <laughs> Quite simply, yeah, they don't. Uh, they're too polite to do Shakespeare. Yeah. Shakespeare is is lusty and you know written for the popular audience. They try to intellectualize it too much, I feel. Uh, but uh, Mr. Kendall used to visit our school, and I think I still believe he's the greatest actor I've ever seen. Not just because of his abilities, but because of his mission of uh, of dedicating his life to. Instead of trying to get supporting parts on in the provincial theatre in England and perform in, you know, Stratford and Nottingham and so on, he opted to do this, which he thought would be significant, and it has been. I think Mr. Kendall's contribution to awareness, uh, theatre awareness among school children in India is unparalleled, even by any. 
so when you talk about acting, we, we really talk about uh, stage, uh, the ability to be in theater, to be able to perform live in front of an audience. All, all of that has a different meaning to acting than, than perhaps going into cinema, which you did thereafter. Not as different as it's made out to be. It's, uh, it's like theater acting compared to film acting, I would use the analogy again of sport, is like a, 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 a marathon and a sprint. Not a marathon, but a long distance race here. A 1500 meter race as against a 100 meter sprint. Film being the sprint and theater being the long distance. But in film, you have the opportunity to, uh, to do it repeat again. and repeat yourself. And you don't like what you just did. You can have three or four takes and yeah. so on and so forth. Whether it's the actor's choice or the director's choice. People make mistakes in the theater as well. You have the next day to correct it. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it's not a, a mistake by an actor. It's not as disastrous as, as, as people imagine it to be. Uh, the actor feels like you know, the earth should open up and swallow me when he forgets. But it doesn't really make that much difference. An audience watching a play doesn't really absorb every single thing that you said or every nuance that you intend. They, they miss a lot of stuff. They're checking their messages, they're, you know, <laughs> making sure their girlfriends got their popcorn and so on, all that sort of thing. Uh, so, um, it's always easy, it's always possible to, to cover up a mistake and important thing is to learn from the mistake. Uh, as in sport, you learn from the mistakes, so you don't end up doing 59 takes. You know, you 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 make a mistake maybe twice or thrice, but then you each mistake helps you get better the next time. What what made you make that uh, transformation from doing theatre to go to cinema? To cinema, it wasn't really a transformation. I I trained in both after graduating. I first trained in theatre at Delhi, then I trained in cinema at the Film Institute. And my professional career in both began simultaneously in the year 75. Uh, I'd acted in plays, of course, in school and college and so on. But uh, the kind of stuff one does in school and college is, you know, it, it sometimes puts people off theatre for life. <laughs> so I'd say professionally, I, I began in both. So I don't consider myself basically a film actor or basically a theatre actor. I'm lucky to have had the opportunity to to do both and I enjoy both and uh, I love both equally. What were your parents' thoughts when you went into acting? I want to be an actor you know, <laughs> or I, I want to be a movie star. Uh, my dad would have blown a fuse <coughs> had I ever said that. I was too scared of him to confess it. Uh, I dreamt of it since I was certain about it by the time I was 12 or 13. The only other thing I wanted to be was a cricketer. Yeah, I love cricket with a passion as well. And uh, I, by the time I was 13 or 14, I realized I'm not good enough. Nobody around to guide me. Uh, I never actually was coached. I, I think I was, I'm pretty good though. Uh, but I, I, I just loved the game and I, uh, but acting was more fun. You know, you, you, you. What was it that drove you to, to, it? to acting? Yes. The hiding behind uh, imaginary, uh, hiding within one's imagination. As I said, I was never good at making friends or I was not known in the school for anything and no one gave me the time of day. I used to come last in class and so on. Uh, Joined the club with just a yeah? similar situation. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and so I found great refuge in... Uh, being other people, the way I suppose you found refuge in the hours of training. Uh, yes, there's a, there's a sense of discipline also that comes from the sport as it does in acting and, and, and the way you went to uh, the Film Institute in yeah. Pura, which, which brings me to that question of, uh, of uh, how important was that education for you at the Film Institute? Very. Being in an institute you're in, in an atmosphere conducive to learning. I don't feel it's essential. There are great actors who've never been to any institute. Uh, they're self-taught, but then there's, there's a very famous saying that acting can't be learned, can't be taught, it has to be learned. There are no rules, there are no textbooks, there's no formulae, there's no right way or wrong way to do it. The way there is in a, in a sport, in a, any other discipline, 
so actors often tend to hide behind uh, you know uh, lethargy as an excuse uh, of it being inspiration in sport you can't afford to do that as an actor you you're able to fake your way through life lot of have and i've even been called good in sport you can't do that no no that no, of course i decided to fake my way through life <laughs> <laughs> my friend uh, roger moore who i happen to do a film with said to me one time uh, you know i'm not an actor i'm a star right and uh, you know i think people outside the industry wouldn't quite get the meaning of that mm. and he re- he said to me you know that i was famous but i'm really not a performer and which which there is a major mm. difference it there is yes and 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 it's very very uh, perceptive of him to, re- to recognize it and yes uh, and and categorize himself thus because he's absolutely right i don't think a star is a person who's got to be predictable a star is a person who has an agenda which he's got to fulfill he has an obligation to the audience which he can't shy away from uh, that's what i feel because you can't let the audience down at the same time the audience must never believe you've become that guy there have been instances of stars working against the grain uh say people like uh, uh, bogart playing villainous parts yes. or yes. you know or clark gable playing sure. uh, uh, you know a seducer or something like that <laughs> but uh, it, it's always um, been where the audience knew the whether whether the line is where the draw line is drawn between the actor i love and the hateful part he's playing yes so if roger had played a lovable villain i think he'd have been a great success i always said he was very good in comedy and he was very good very yeah funny and man. very charming yes, yes very dapper but then you look at the true actors in the overseas cinema that we've looked at the de niros and the duvals and the pacinos and the hoffmans and all these guys who went to strasburg and these famous acting schools over the years they come out with a different perspective of what acting is all about and uh, often you see them sort of hold back when they feel they're not actually working with someone who is sort of, their of level. off that level or of their caliber of of giving that same kind of performance and uh, yeah. it, it, it's hard to see that it's it's tough and it's you know it seems to me uncharitable on their part at times Uh, since you mentioned these names all very respected actors i had the pleasure of working with mr connery yes who, who i've always loved i was going to come to that league of yeah. extraordinary yeah. gentlemen yeah. yes he's great i love him i love clint eastwood i love jack nicholson yes. the amazing thing is that actors like connery and eastwood and nicholson despite playing the same kind of part for over 40 45 years <laughs> have not become boring <laughs> to watch yeah not at all not at all not at all exactly de niro has perhaps become boring pacino has perhaps become boring duval of course is another league you know duval is the duval is the ken rosewall <laughs> of acting <laughs> yeah, yeah. about the same size too about the same way. size too that's <laughs> it i'm just going to go back and talk a little bit about this group that you formed early on called The Motley Group. Motley Group. Yes. The Motley Group uh, was formed by Benjamin Gilani and myself. In the year 79 we did our first production. Uh Ben and I are both English literature graduates. So we started off with a uh, the wish list that we both had uh of the Shaws and the Samuel Beckets and the Harold Pinters and so on that we'd studied in school and college and started doing those plays. For many years we performed plays only in English. We tried to emulate Mr. Kendall by by touring and performing in schools, which we still do occasionally. Though now uh, my presence there tends to, you know, uh, disturb the students because they've seen the movies I I've, I've been in and so on, so they don't associate me with theatre but with movies. So unfortunately, that activity has gotten limited, which I which I regret. But I love performing to to school children and Motley has often done that. and then um we attempted one shakespeare we have attempted number of shaw uh and so on and then we in the year 2000 we attempted our first urdu production which was an enactment of stories by the famous urdu writer ismat chuptai then other writers like sadat hasan manto and munshi premchand and so on now what we concentrate on is a kind of theater which is shown 
of all frills, uh, which has nothing on stage except what is absolutely essential. I've been through the whole phase of loving the Broadway plays and so on, you know. I, I got tired of watching them because it's not theater. It's it's part cinema, it's part magic show, it's part cabaret, it's part rock concert, you know. Watching a Broadway play, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Uh, and, and this kind of illusory magic is not what is the identity of theater. The identity of theater is the living person up there who tries to get across to you. It's the exchange of energies that happens between actor and audience, where actor and audience are one, so to say. Does this, does that thinking still exist as far as enhancing one's craft? Unfortunately, no, unfortunately not. What has happened is we've gotten so dazzled by this, this, this creation of illusion on stage, by those of us who've traveled abroad and seen plays on the Broadway or on the West End or so on. Which, are, which is all completely, in my opinion, you know, tricks of illusion, really, not of communicating. Theatre is a tool for communicating, to my mind. But most of us are trying to emulate those kind of plays, and so we end up doing tatty replicas of Jesus Christ Superstar or something we're not at all equipped to do. We don't have the machinery, we don't have the technical know-how, we don't have the imagination, and of course we don't have the skill to do a thing like Cats over here, for example. The level of skill required to do a play like Cats, you need, you need 40 singers and dancers who are not just ordinary, who are good. Impossible to find. So the kind of theater we have resorted to, and, and I find inspiration for that in a teaching by a great Polish teacher called Grotowski, who said that our poverty of resources should be our strength, not our weakness. So we should not aspire toward creating the kind of fantastical world that these theatres of the West do, but make our poverty, our strength, ergo, remove from everything, remove everything from theatre, which isn't essential to communication. No sets, no decoration, nothing there for decorative value. Get rid even of properties, even of costumes, have everybody dressed in a basic black, so the audience gets the text in its purity. Um, that's what we are trying in Motley. That's really uh, that's really pure acting, though. That comes yeah. down to the performer itself. Absolutely, yeah. and exactly. and I think that's the true test of a performer to be alone on stage for an hour and hold the audience's attention. Not easy. There can be no greater challenge. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. When, when you look at your uh, cinema today, films today, and uh, yourself, for example, and you. Look at your films, you obviously have successes, failures, box office receipts that go through the roof and some that do not. How do you deal with the highs and lows in this industry where everything doesn't revolve entirely around you, but there's such a team that put, puts it together, whether it's the cameraman, the lighting, the director, whatever else, the writer, of course, the scriptwriter, and so on. How do, you, how do you deal with that? You put it behind you, like you put a defeat behind you. You can't afford to dwell on it. And I'm fortunate, you've in fact defined my position very well, uh, because I'm fortunate that I don't have this whole project depend on me. I wouldn't be able to take the responsibility. I can't imagine the nightmarish situation of having hundreds of crores depend on whether you can deliver or not. You might be having a bad day. You might not be feeling well. <laughs> what do you do? So I, I'm very fortunate to have worked myself quite quickly into a position in the industry where I didn't have to lose my sleep over whether my next film would run or not. Uh, I, I never continued to get work because I was saleable or marketable or whatever these terms that the film industry uses are, but because uh, I, I could deliver the goods. I suppose. I, I think I cottoned on to that early. Uh, when you're good, you're good. So, you know, I mean, people then can't do without you. It's not a question of whether you're up or down. It's more important that you're good. No, Vijay. The trouble in cinema a lot depends on being cast right, on being presented right, on being guided right, uh, on being lit right sometimes. Uh, a, a good performance can look like a bad one if not, uh, if not orchestrated properly. You know, but when you have, if you look at a script and you look at a, 
uh, look at the words. I mean, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. We know that. But I mean, if you look at a script and you say, yes, that's the character I would like to play because it's a challenge, irrespective of it not being the star of the film, can you see that right away, that you'd like to play that particular role in the film? Yes. Yes. I can see that. I've often been offered scripts where I was offered the lead, but I read on reading through it, I realized there is a smaller part is far more, going to be far more fun. Fun to me is the operative word. Uh, and luckily, in our job, you can work and have fun at the same time. Uh, to me, the fun is in the creation, not in the chatting between shots, you know, it's uh, for, like it is for a lot of film actors. But uh, I can see that. And, and now to me, more important than my part is the project I'm in. Because an actor is remembered, uh, a film actor is remembered through the work he did, through the films he chose. Um, uh, uh, stage actors have an advantage because it's ephemeral. Uh, it's not on record. Uh, no one knew how great an actor Stanislavski was. Mm. For all we know, he might have been a dreadful actor. Yes. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, the word of mouth, yes. myth, etc. So, myth is part of theater, mythology. And, and I think we're lucky that that is the case. You, you, you record a play and watch it 50 years later, it looks ludicrous. Uh, I've seen, you know, very fine plays which were wonderful on stage. But they just don't translate uh, in cinema. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you just uh, have to... I have to find a way to deal, find a way to adjust the way you have to adjust to a clay court or a hard court. Yes, good analogy. Yes, court. yes, absolutely. 39 years you've been in this business. How is that possible to be so consistent and, uh, and at the same time perform to the best of your ability because you're picking a film that you obviously like to do? I've done about 250 movies. Oh, well, there we are then. then uh, so then it's about five of you. I've you do five done movies a year. a year. I mean, uh, that's a lot. I mean, why would you, first of all, want to work that much, five movies a year? Because a movie takes, on an average, a month or a month and a half to complete. You should. So, yeah, so you can easily fit in five in a year. Five is very little, in fact. 250 is not a huge amount compared to some movies contemporaries of mine have done. They've done 400 and 500 and so on. I, I, I'm known as somewhat selective, so I've done fewer. It's, uh, well, part of it was uh, wanting to do meaningful cinema and not being able to make a living out of it. Wanting to do theatre, not being able to make a living out of it. So having to resort to the popular format to keep the kitchen fires burning. And at the same time, I don't deny wanting to be popular. Every actor, everyone who becomes an actor becomes an actor because he wants to be popular. Quite is it? Is it? Uh, are you, but again, you know, it's <laughs> it's a little bit of a contradiction. You, you're hi, you're hired to do a role or or a part in a film because you're good, or not just because you're popular. I'm lucky to be in that position. Oh. I'm well. I'm. I, I. I mean, I don't kid myself. I'm not unpopular. Though, though, I I thank my stars that I don't have to live with the kind of adulation uh, Mr. Bachchan has to live with. I don't know how he could handle it. I don't know how people like Shah Rukh and Amir and so on handle it. I guess there must be something in it they relish. So they, they handle it so well. But uh, I know for sure I wouldn't be able to do it. I've had my share of, uh, of fame and so on. And I, I realized I don't really... It doesn't give me a kick of any kind. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, my work being appreciated is something that gives me a kick. And the satisfaction that I gain, uh, having played a good game, even though I may have lost, is something which, you know, which I relish. Nasir, we were talking earlier on about, um, about cinema and how many cinemas, how many pictures rather you can do in the course of a year and what may be the optimum. What would have been the most challenging role that you've played in all of the cinemas that you've done? Cinema first and then we talk about on uh, stage. Uh, when I had to sing a song in one of these popular movies, I found that uh, it defeated me completely and continued to do so for many years. At the Film Institute, we had a class conducted called Playback. 
playback. Those days there were no iPods and so on. There were only 33 RPM. Yes. So they'd play the song and you had to gyrate to the song. And, and I found it so <laughs> ridiculous to do that that I never attended any of those classes. Also, I never believed I'd have to do this kind of thing in a movie. As luck would have it, I ended up having to run around trees and sing songs. And I, I've never felt so ridiculous or incompetent in my life. <laughs> so that, I would say, is easily the most challenging thing I've done. <laughs> so when, you, when you saw the role, did, uh, what did you think? I felt, what is a guy who looks like that doing in a film like this? <laughs> <laughs> and I did not stop feeling that. Uh, whenever I did these movies where where everything is screaming out its artificialness, you know, not just the settings and the characters and the, the situations, but, you know, the clothes the people are wearing, the, the kind of things they ask to say, and everything is just pure synthetic. And there I was in these movies trying to be real. That was a big mistake, and I never ever fitted into those movies. Uh, but, as I said, I kept, uh, for some reason, getting work in them. And I kept mistakenly trying to be real in those films, uh, which is why I guess it never worked, and I could never quite deliver the goods in, in, in that kind of a movie. How do you sustain yourself in, 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 the, in the industry? What, what kind of, not just motivates you, obviously, the acting motivates you. You grew up as an actor, you studied acting, you... You're a performer on stage. You're entertaining people with the quality of your performance as opposed to the everything else that goes around you that we talk about, the fluff and so on. But how do you sustain yourself in the industry? I, I became an actor because I wanted to be looked at. That's the truth. I did not think I would end up conducting a study of acting, that I would get so obsessed with it that I would rather die than not act. I did not think I would end up traveling to Poland and Paris to study with masters. I did not think uh, I would uh, become, uh, I would occupy the kind of position that I fortunately do. I became an actor because I wanted to be looked at. I wanted to meet girls. Quite simply, as Mr. Hoffman confessed, and he's very truthful about it. <laughs> yeah, he became an actor because he wanted to meet girls. He's still looking too. <laughs> <laughs> he's still... <laughs> Along the way, I kind of felt that there's something more to it than just good fortune or a lottery or adulation and was lucky enough to find it and... Uh, that's what sustains me. The fact that I know that as long as I live, I can keep trying to improve. And that is where I, from being a sportsman, because as a sportsman, your life, your sporting life comes to an end at a point. Acting is the only sport where you can get better as you get older, provided you, you look after your body, which can pack up at any time. So it's your responsibility to look after it. And luckily, unlike a sportsman, we don't have to go through the kind of punishment the body has to go through uh, in a sportsman's case. So, so, so my dreams of waving to the crowd at Wimbledon and all <laughs> <laughs> have sublimated themselves, <laughs> throwing my racket into the air. Yes. You know, uh, it has. They have sublimated into uh, in, into discovering, uh, uh, into researching. Human behavior, which is really what it's all about, acting and getting across. What would you, what would you qualify as, um, as excellence, as um, success? What, what is your perception or your look at uh, being excellent in your field? I mean, not just a critic telling you you were, we are fantastic in that role in a newspaper article after the premiere is over, but uh, you know, in your own depth of your mind? It's probably, I don't think anybody starts their life with a, with a, we, we have a desire to, to triumph, perhaps. Excel is not a word that occurs to many of us at that age. Um, 
some of it take to it as a defense, some of it take to it as a statement. Uh, a sportsman, I suppose, does it as a statement of his ability. It's, it's, it's the desire to survive that uh, starts it and the realization that in order to survive, you have to have your, your craft at your command. And there is such a thing as craft and I've got to learn it. I think that is where it begins. Um, it, it, it can only be defined in others. I don't think one, one should try defining it with regard to oneself. It can only be, be defined with regard to others and with regard to others, I would say I would define a remarkable person as one who, who has more than me and who badly wants to share. That's how I would define it. It's a person who recognizes his place in life and continues to occupy it. And, and that is why uh, I would hesitate to apply it to, and just jumping back a little bit to the group of actors who you named, there are many of them who, 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 who felt that, that they were more important than the work they did and thus began to knock that kind of work, not take it seriously anymore. It's not a, an admirable uh, approach, in my opinion. And which is why I called Duval the, the Ken Rosewall of acting, uh, uh, a person who never sought the limelight, who, who stayed in the background, who was great, who never won the one championship which really mattered at that time to everybody. No one knew of the four, at least I didn't. I knew only of Wimbledon when I was in class seven. And I also happened to know that Lever while Fraser wanted the for him and so on. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Excellent. But, uh, but, but yeah, but Rosewall, and then I had the good fortune to see him play yes. at Wimbledon in the veterans. Yes. Was, anyway, but that's another story. So that's the kind of person who who doesn't try to um, uh, to knock what brought him here in the first place, who continues to occupy that space and find meaning in it. Interesting, because in our sport, of course, you know, there, if you look back and say, okay, I played these great matches. Yes, I won some of them, but there's some that stand out where your, your tennis was, was spot on. You were in the zone, as we call it. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, you, you felt so good about yourself that the ball seemed that big, you know, the court seemed huge. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't wrong. miss. Exactly. Exactly. So I often wondered whether in a performer, when he's performing in a scene, in a very tense sequence that he's able to tell that, yes, I nailed it. I really yes. hit it on the head. Yes, you are. So that's a, you are. You don't ever lose yourself in the performance. No, I don't buy actors who talk that stuff. If you lose yourself, you don't know what you're doing. It's when you are at your best that you're aware of every single thing. It's very much like sport that way. As far as uh, theater and cinema is concerned, what's your preference? Still remain with theater? As far as singles and doubles is concerned, what's your preference? <laughs> <laughs> make more money playing singles. <laughs> <laughs> I make more money doing films. There you go. There you go. That's probably what it is. But, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, well, no. I also believe cinema serves a very... can serve a very significant function. I don't believe in cinema as art. Uh, a true cinema artist occurs once in a century. Uh, there's very few who can... Who can Qualify. Uh, I don't believe in it as a tool of teaching either. Documentaries perhaps can teach or alter people's lives, alter people's consciousness, not features. What the important function cinema serves is to act as a record of its times. That is where I consider cinema important. And that's why I feel it my responsibility to participate in movies which, uh, you know, which are thus, which, which, which don't create this uh, sugar candy world but which talk of our country as it is, and that's why when the, the movie is made in Pakistan, or whether it's made in New York, or whether it's made in, uh, you know, Cambodia or in Sri Lanka, I'm part of it. If I feel it's a movie which a hundred years from now will be seen and which people will say, okay, that's, that's how this country was at that time. That's the significant function cinema can serve. Draw a comparison, if you can, between working with uh, 
uh, uh, Sean Connery in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and uh, some of the Dharmendra. films that you've done here. Hmm. <laughs> Much of a difference. Sean, uh, with the difference that I idolized Sean, I didn't idolize any actor in India to that extent. There were many I liked. Uh, Shammi Kapoor being one. Sean, I saw playing James Bond when I was in class nine. And he as was, did we all. As did we all. Yes. And I, I, I was, I, a, a large part of the reason for taking that movie was the chance to get to meet him. And I found him very much down to earth, very talkative, very chatty. A guy who actually listens to what you're saying, unlike most celebrities. Uh, but you've got to keep in mind that this is Sean Connery you're talking to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is Sean Connery I'm dealing with. Yes. Yeah, yes. so so I I always addressed him as sir, though he kept saying, call me Sean. So I said, no, I can't. In India, we do not call our elders and betters by their first names. And it is something he could not comprehend. <laughs> also, he was he was he was shouting at the director one day and saying, I've done 40. So 40 films, you know, 40. So I said, Sean, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I've done 250. <laughs> yes. Yes. So in that sense, there wasn't... Um, we have some stars in India who are very decent, who, who uh, perhaps one can talk to, though I haven't bumped into any of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean also in the... In the, in the um, the way of making the movie, yes, making the it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. They have more money. That's all. A, a, on a freezing winter night in Prague, they can, you know, you can, they can keep you warm and so on, and you're looked after as 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 you are here as well. The extras, of course, have to fend for themselves, huddle around a fire. Yes. The stars are on velvet all the time. It's the same. Uh, they're more organized than us. That's about it. Right. Uh, your wife is a brilliant actor herself. Any uh, little rivalry or competition <laughs> within no, the we family? We don't aspire to the same parts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's wonderful and she's been very supportive. She's had to uh, not put her career on hold, but she's had to live with the fact that she doesn't really get the parts that she merits. Uh, she hasn't let it destroy her because she's found a lot of meaning in, uh, you know, being the boss of the household and being a mother. She's found a great deal of meaning in that and she's been great in that role. So I sometimes have to remind her that, look, you, I think you've got as much work as you need to do. I don't think you could have done more. But she does feel that she hasn't really got her due and I agree with her. Though I tend to think that she will, as an elder actor, get her due. She's really wonderful and I, I, you know, she's been a, she's been a guiding, uh, a tremendous tonic for me all, all my, ever since I met her. Though she does consider tennis her rival. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now you're getting all these roles now with, uh, with, uh, yeah, with the young, leading ladies. Leading ladies, yeah. yeah how, do you, the, how do you accept these roles? Oh, well, 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 I love gusto, it. I presume. I, yeah, I love it. I mean, imagine working with Madhuri Dikshit, with uh, uh, Deepika Padukone. My goodness. Yeah. And Sunny Leone, one after the other. What's left? I mean, I have to invent new fantasies now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And and how do you how do you find working with them? Because obviously they're from a different generation. I like it. Uh, they are... Uh, Deepika is too young to be awed by me. She doesn't really, you know, I don't think she's seen too much of my work, and which is great because she addresses me as Nasir, which I love. Uh, everybody else calls me Nasir Bhai or Sir, you know. I have to live with it, uh, as I was telling Sean. But uh, Madhuri, it was a great joy working with her. She's a marvelous actor, very down to earth. And it's amazing that someone of her luster who's seen stardom of that stature, you know, still considers herself an ordinary housewife and who considers herself quite ordinary. Marvelous. 
I love it. I love romancing yeah. Vidya Balan, who's also another darling, absolutely wonderful creature. So it's very. Uh, I I think I'm in. I'm very privileged to get this opportunity at this age. That's just uh, that's terrific. I, when I saw that, I was uh, I was more than impressed. Let me tell you, <laughs> I think that's absolutely wonderful. Let me just ask you a couple more final questions here. Um, the first is, let me. Can you tell the viewer, tell the young? Actors, potential actors and actresses, you know how they could follow their dream in this line of work. I think you've got to recognize very early that act, the doing acting is what you need to do. Not only is what you enjoy, what you want to use to make you, you make you rich. Uh, you got to recognize that it's what you need to do, and if that's not the case, don't do it. Um, unless you got to ask yourself the question, and I, I'm quite serious about this: Would I rather die than not act? And if the answer is yes, only then opt for it. See, it's because it is. You know, it it doesn't depend on you. It is such a nebulous. There's nothing in common between all the successful actors we've had. What is in common between all the successful sportsmen we've had is the perseverance, quality of perseverance. Uh, that's what differentiates, uh, you know, a truly great from a not so great. You can't define it that easily. There are many instances of hardworking actors. The trouble is, you got to know what to work hard at, and in acting, there's it's not so easy to define, and there's nobody to guide you. So unless you begin to find glimmers of that, don't do it, because the because because what you got to face is very heartbreaking, and you can find no explanation for it. When you lose in a sport, there's always a reason. Uh, when you lose at acting, there's not necessarily a reason. And you've got to learn to live with that. So unless it really matters more to you than life itself, don't do it. Enjoy talking with you, Nasir. Really, a real joy talking with you and learning more about tennis and sport <laughs> and acting. But uh, the next time we're together, we're going to hit some tennis balls on your court. I would love that. Absolutely, and you're invited anytime. Lovely to see you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.